Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. And just following on from the previous two presentations, which looked um, at dedicated case studies, we're now just going to try and wrap up and look more generally at the cases that were involved in the project that we undertook. Um, and to see what lessons can be learned and what sort of uh, overall or meta data we can um, extract from the various different projects um, and studies. Okay, so um, my name is Paula Sullivan and I'm based at Cork Institute of Technology in Ireland um, and I was involved in Annex 62. Let's see if I can get the screen to move here. Okay, so I'm on slide two. This is the agenda. I'll skip this really because we don't have much time. Um, but we're going to look at the case study buildings. We look at some of the influence of the design, what strategies were used, how we control those strategies, and what lessons learned we can take from that. Um, so well documented case studies of ventilative cooling. This is a, one of the main tasks of Annex 62. I'm on slide four now. And just looking at the objectives of Annex 62, the bottom one here we can see was to demonstrate the performance of ventilative cooling solutions through analysis and evaluation of well-documented case studies. Um, and to break that out in a little bit more detail on slide five, we wanted to look specifically at the analysis and evaluation of performance of ventilative cooling in practice, um, and then see if we can establish some lessons learned and some recommendations for both the design and operation phases, as well as identifying uh, barriers for application, and so on. Um, so we had uh, quite a number of case studies. Um, what climates are covered in those? We had 14 well-documented buildings in total. And within that, we had about 10 of our cases were in temperate climates. We have the Kopp and Geiger classification here, you can see on the screen. And about four of our case studies were in cold climates, and uh, unfortunately, we had no hot climates in our analysis. Um, but we, did, we still did get a spread of different types of summers, warm summers, hot summers, um, and whether we had dry seasons or not. So we can see here that we have five different climate classifications where buildings were operating and data was collected from. So who, where, what, when? So what information have we got on these case studies? Uh, where are they from and so on? So we can see here a, a breakdown of the residential, which is on the lower part of the screen and the non-residential um, on the upper part of the screen. What we have in total here is about um, 10 participating countries giving us or providing 14 case studies. 85% of these were actually operational and uh, construction completed and operational after 2010, so relatively recent in nearly all cases. Three of them are in 2014 and two in 2013 and so on. And eight of these buildings um, were in a rural application and six of them were in a suburban application. So we have a pretty good spread of different situations or scenarios where we would find ventilative cooling, urban and suburban and rural, um, as well as education, office and residential um, uses or applications. Um, okay, so this is our breakdown. And we can see as well our floor areas. We had anything from uh, very large office buildings down to very small test beds um, or you know, research kind of facilities and so on. Okay. So what were the design influence for ventilative cooling? Guilherme alluded to in his presentation the idea that there are different uh, things that can influence the design of ventilative cooling. And we, for each case study, we looked at that, um, and I'm trying to capture everything here across all the case studies. Um, Guilherme showed an example where he looked specifically at the kindergarten, and we can see overall here, you have a whole range of different parameters can influence ventilative cooling, and we rank them according to each case study in low, medium, high level of influence in the design. So the people involved in the design provided information on what were the key drivers um, for choosing ventilative cooling and choosing particular strategies within that as well. So I think what we can see here is that cost was a, was a, was a major driver. The lower initial costs in terms of capital investment, lower maintenance costs and lower energy costs were all high influences on the selection of uh, ventilative cooling as a strategy. Reducing solar loads and air leakage at the end of our chart were also 
um, displaying relatively high levels of influence in, in the choice of ventilative cooling strategy, whether we went with ventilative cooling or not, and within that then what strategy was chosen. So there's a quite a, a large spread. It's difficult to draw any specific conclusion here other than to maybe get an overall appreciation for the type of um, characteristics in the design process that influence um, how we choose ventilative cooling strategies and principles. Um, so how do we do ventilative cooling? Here we can see that we've got a number of different, let's say, concepts from natural, uh, naturally driven ventilation or ventilative cooling to mechanical uh, supply only, exhaust only, night ventilation, um, a mechanical or natural night ventilation, sorry, air conditioning and so on. And what we can see here actually is that while natural ventilation is used in a large amount of case studies, this is very often coupled with some other strategy um, in order to complement that to improve its potential to provide cooling. So we have a, a good spread. We have some at the, on the right hand side here of this graph where we have some unique bespoke solutions such as Maria's example that she just spoke on with the phase change materials. Uh, we have earth air heat exchangers in a property in Italy um, and some indirect evaporative cooling as well. Uh, in Ghent in Belgium. So there's a good spread of different solutions, but over the overarching, um, I suppose, information here is that natural ventilation is very often coupled with other solutions to achieve ventilative cooling. The summary points on these strategies is that 86% of the cases use natural ventilation and generally the sensible internal loads were less than 30 watts per square meter in these particular case studies. 50% um, of buildings use hybrid ventilative cooling. So there was a combination of natural cooling along with some mechanical strategy. And this was the most prevalent, um, this hybrid VC is the most prevalent approach. And in this situation, the internal loads, for example, in Norway and Belgium were greater than 40 watts per square meter, but they were less than 10 watts in Austria and Italy. So just to try to give some appreciation of the range of internal loads appropriate for different strategies for ventilative cooling. And the number of days with a maximum daily external temperature greater than 25 across our case studies, just looking at the, the climate and the appropriateness of different climates for VC, it ranged actually anywhere from 10 days um, with maximum daily external temperatures greater than 25 degrees all up to 120 days in Japan. Um, so there was a, a large range of climates, again, where these solutions were applied. How do we control ventilative cooling? Again, looking across the case studies in the project. What we find when we looked at these <clears throat> is that irrespective of whether it's natural, mechanical or hybrid, nearly all of these different configurations or approaches will adopted or used internal temperature and external temperature as criteria that influenced or was uh, used in the control strategy itself. Um, we see for mechanical ventilation, then precipitation doesn't feature, wind, uh, thermal mass slab temperature, um, and external RH, sorry, thermal mass slab temperature. If these don't feature in mechanical systems, um, whereas uh, the na in, for natural ventilation, we do see wind as an influencing input or a control input, CO2 if we're controlling on indoor air quality as well as uh, indoor thermal environment. Um, and overall, we see lots of different factors being used depending on the case study, but the, the internal and external temperature are the key drivers. The internal temperature is used in controlling up to nearly 95% of examples. <clears throat> we had one example that had a fully manual control strategy, so it didn't have uh, even internal temperature as an input. So there are a range of different options uh, in terms of how we control our VC systems. Breaking that out in terms of occupied hours, systems that use daytime ventilation only and systems that use nighttime ventilation, we still see again across both of those applications that internal and external temperature uh, are, are very important or are common parameters using, used to control our systems. Um, and again, our hybrid systems are using both the internal and external temperature irrespective of whether it's occupied hours or daytime. Uh, temperatures. There's very few examples where VOCs or the external dew point temperatures being used during occupied hours and very little examples where the max external day temperature or the max zone day temperature uh, from the previous day, the minus one suggests a previous day, that these are being used 
in a, a control strategy to update um, set points and, and target temperatures um, and so on. So in summary here, we can say temperature and RH are the main parameters used for controlling VC. CO2, when indoor air quality was important, internal air temperatures used by all case studies with set point control. So the internal air temperature was always used the mean internal air temperature set point was around 22 degrees, somewhere between 20 and 24 degrees, depending on the case study, but that was the, the range we observed. Uh, over 60% of these case studies use external temperature as a low temperature limit. So a lot of these case studies are using some parameter, um, and it can be anywhere from 10 to 18 degrees, but the, the limit was around 14 degrees, where the air temperatures was below that, um, the VC was not available for cooling. Uh, to try and reduce the risks of overcooling and, and, and drafts um, and uh, unacceptable levels of thermal comfort. So all NVK studies had occupant interaction with the VC system, so there was always some level of manual interaction. Only 60% of hybrid systems had this interaction, however, so that was removed in some of those systems. It was a, a fully automated or controlled um, scenario. 69% of the cases had nighttime ventilation strategy and wind speeds had to be less than 10 meters per second with no rain for these systems to function or to be available for cooling. So how have these buildings performed? Um, again, this is just showing our climate indicator again, and we can see the range from 10 to about 120 days where the external daily temperature uh, or the max external daily temperature was 20 greater than 25 degrees. So we see a good spread of applications uh, across a lot of climates here and with different systems then applied to different climates. The preliminary results from the VC performance evaluation, uh, these results show that uh, on the right hand side, we can look at the percentage of hours above uh, some threshold, static threshold value. Um, and we see that you know, we had very good performance um, in, in many instances with around 1%, uh, the, the guidelines generally suggest, depending on, I suppose, whether you look at ASHRAE or SIBSI or, or a particular country, normally it's around 1% um, of the occupied hours shouldn't be above 28 degrees. And we see that in nearly all applications here, this worked very well. There was a slightly different um, acceptability criteria for the kindergarten in Portugal, and Guilherme spoke about that and presented some information on that. So overall, we see that even in, in operation, after looking at one year's worth of data, um, data we find that these buildings do in fact um, provide satisfactory conditions for their indoor environments using a combination of natural uh, ventilative cooling and some mechanical um, hybrid solution as well to support that. So, so what lessons did we learn? So we broke these up under design and construction. Um, in total, we were able to extract about 31 uh, common lessons learned or 31 lessons learned across all cases with the design and construction phase and about 33 for the operation phase so 33 lessons learned so i've just captured a few here and i'd recommend that you go and look at the summary document for the case study work and um, if you look at that document afterwards you can see in much more detail for each case study what sort of information or what sort of you know recommendations uh, lessons learned um, and good feedback from the experience of using those systems um, provides insight and so on. So the design and construction, there's, there's a few here. So one detailed building simulation is important when simulating ventilative cooling. So this was a big one that we felt across a lot of case studies. You know, detailed simulation is needed if you're using VC strategies, particularly where there's a natural ventilation component to ensure a robust um, and sound prediction of the performance in the design phase to avoid, obviously, headaches um, in post-construction during your operation. Um, this is most important when designing hybrid systems where multiple uh, mechanical systems needed harmonization. Some studies also that assuming the window opening in detail was important, and this doesn't always happen. Sometimes designers rely on rules of thumb or simplified approaches. Uh, and a number of studies say that there needs to be some good amount of work done on the window opening um, in terms of the ventilation rate performance in design to, again, ensure we have good and sound um, performance in terms of occupant satisfaction uh, with the indoor environment throughout the uh, cooling season. The customization is also an important factor that there's many examples, and even Guilherme and Maria showed two very interesting case studies where 
your customization, uh, bespoke design and custom designs were needed to ensure that there was good compliance with regulations and also uh, performance. Um, there was good levels of performance as well. So this needs to be a factor if you're considering designing VC systems, you may need to include for the uh, the time and the resources needed to develop uh, bespoke solutions. Clients' expectations need to be managed as well, and this is uh, an important aspect of VC, uh, particularly on the, uh, issues like rain ingress, insect prevention, what their expectations are with these, and how they can inhibit or restrict the actual amount of cooling potential available when we build in these preventative measures in terms of you know, insect um, prevention and rain ingress uh, as examples. So this is something that you have to have a lot of client uh, input early on and uh, a real integrated process because uh, the VC systems, if they're using passive strategies, um, yeah, you're relying on factors and, and, and sort of boundary conditions there that can't always be controlled and regulated. So there need to be a lot of interaction and responsiveness from the building users. Um, so ventilated cooling systems were considered cost effective and energy efficient. So most studies said that this was a good thing, particularly with the naturally ventilated systems. Uh, and manual and con manual control was important as well in these, particularly in a domestic setting. Automated controls weren't seen to being very effective um, in terms of the, the satisfaction with the overall performance. In terms of operation, Engaging with the building owners or operators as soon as possible is integral to guaranteeing building performance for AAQ. We just kind of spoke about that. Uh, some cases, this meant educating or working with the facilities operators or managers for the building. For others, it meant educating the building occupiers themselves. And this really, I suppose, leads to a post-occupancy uh, consultancy role or post-occupancy evaluation, um, or basically engaging with your systems after the building is up and operational. And that fine tuning, so tuning your uh, systems to ensure that they're uh, performing well uh, across multiple different seasons, and in particular the shoulder seasons, that what configuration is in place in winter may not work well in the shoulder seasons, and that may not work well in summer. So that needs to be worked on um, in terms of calibrating your building and your VC system. And this engagement should happen as early as possible in the operation. So these are. Um, these really are, are, are only a, a capturing a small sample of, of all of these different lessons learned that we have available in our documentation. Uh, just very quickly, and uh, we're nearly finished, um, VC is generally a good option. Correct maintenance and calibration is integral, which we just spoke about. Uh, we need to exploit the outside air more with lower external air temperature control limits. So some work needs to be done on what is an appropriate limit um, in terms of the air, lowest air temperatures you can bring into a space. Um, and does that change during operation or occupancy, uh, daytime occupancy and nighttime operation? And is there some sophisticated or some allowance for that in your control approach that you can vary your low temperature control limit? Auto suggested then that exploring thermal mass was absolutely key, uh, but care must be taken with this, considering these low temperatures uh, in some case studies in cold climates you can end up with an overcooling. So again, the risk is always with overcooling and particularly during those shoulder seasons when you're transitioning from winter to summer. Uh, we've seen that that can be a problem. So I just wanna finish up by directing you towards the case study brochures. We developed some, a number of brochures, uh, 14 in total, I think it was for each case study. And these brochures contain a lot of rich information on the performance and they've been tailored for each case study because uh, every case study approach their particular performance evaluation differently. So you have 11 different sections, and I think there's lots of really useful information for designers uh, and practitioners and installers in these um, brochures, and you will nearly always find a billing that suits your particular application or your use pattern and so on. Um, so they're available on the Annex 62 website, um, as well as a summary document. So we tried to capture everything in, a, in an overall summary document with that had the key lessons learned and some recommendations and some of the, um, the key performance data for those buildings. So uh, the link is there at, um, on the bottom of the screen. So please you know, go there and have a look at the information and see if you can identify some that may be beneficial to you in your research, your design, or your operation of your VC system. So thank you. I just wanted to finish and say I hope everyone's keeping safe and healthy and you know it's even now we can see that good ventilation of our homes and workspaces is a key recommendation 
uh, from the WHO as well as um, from other sort of recognised uh, institutes. So I think it's quite important for us that we 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 develop good ventilation systems that work well. So that's me. Thanks very much for your time.